now has gotten into uh, the upper middle class you know group uh, these are people with no religious background uh, rely on internet and and, and, and they are uh, going into all this uh, you know uh, i suppose uh, uh, terrorism and and, and violent extremism now of course uh, the term terrorism is derived from the latin words terrorism or to tremble and to deteriorate to fight which means to cause anxiety and, uh, anxiety and um, the other um, definition is by Smith which argue that violence is a pattern uh, or form of organization that act against the failures and, and of government policy and thus affect the public and a symbolic act design based on influenced by using act or acts to threats of, of violence. So um, there is a, a, you need to understand the difference between violence and also um, uh, how it affects or it has a um, you know, con connection with, with uh, security. Yeah? So, so it is something that, uh, you know, to be, to be understood as a deliberate and politically motivated violence and involved destruction, violence and threat to human values and, and, and property. The violence has been used as a weapon to create a climate of panic that has created a great uh, amount of uncertainty for, for society. And uh, in, in Malaysia, we experienced this and, uh, in a series of, of threats and armed attacks by rebel groups. And, uh, and that time Malaya uh, was once uh, dominated by a, a rebel group established by the communists after the Japanese uh, defeat after the Second World War. And they are called the, the, the Malayan people, anti-Japanese army or NPAJA, was a group of rebel uh, who caused chaos in Malaya at that time, and following uh, their 14 day occupation in 1945. So the aftermath uh, again, uh, May 13, 1969, uh, a black hawk uh, erupted following racial tension and was the culmination of the issues of unity uh, uh, in this country. This event had resulted in bloodshed, which claimed the life of, of many at the time. And the other uh, development is the, the um, Al Mauna terrorist group, which uh, is a movement of um, militant, uh, a group that uh, um, actually uh, wanted to uh, attack the, the, the government and also the, the Agong at the time, or the king. And uh, also very, um, you know, this is one of the uh, highlights of, of uh, terrorist uh, you know, activities in this country. And um, Latest is, of course, uh, the media reports of militant terrorists attacked by the ISIS or IIS at the entertainment club in Selangor, in one of the states in, in Malaysia. So it, it proved that terrorism threat uh, are growing in Malaysia, as uh, reported by Guna Ratna in 2016. Uh, you know, and this had actually led the government to be more vigilant uh, and, and uh, especially the police and military to control areas of areas that have been uh, earmarked as uh, terrorist uh, areas. And the other uh, event uh, or, or 
uh, incident is where uh, Malaysia is also exposed to the invasion of Sulu rebels uh, in southern uh, Philippines and, and Bahad Datu area, more or district in, in Sabah, in uh, North Borneo. And the, the insurgent attacks were, of course, not religious in nature, but uh, the attack carried out by a group had caused a stir in Bahad Datu Sabah area. And the government had to come up with uh, a security plan that involved the police and the army uh, to keep Sabah waters uh, safe. Yeah? So, uh, political uh, stability, economic development, and the well being of people, these are very important. These are essential to maintain uh, peace and ensuring uh, national security. So, um, this uh, in Malaysia therefore cannot escape the instability of political instability. The deterioration of well being of neighboring countries is also important. So, uh, the threat of violence uh, that could have an impact on national security is something that, that we have to take note. And also, the, the position, the geographical and demographic uh, position of Malaysia, uh, which lies in the heart of Southeast Asian country uh, or the region and share its borders directly with five regional countries, namely Brunei, Philippines, Indonesia, Singapore, and Thailand. So uh, in the north, uh, Malaysia shares the land border with Thailand. Uh, meanwhile, in the south, uh, we have uh, Singapore. Yeah? So whereas in the east, Malaysia it has a maritime border with Philippines in North Borneo or in Borneo waters. Uh, in addition, Malaysia, Brunei Darussalam shares the land border with Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia's largest neighbor is Indonesia that shares land borders and maritime areas. Malaysia is also difficult. Uh, it's a difficulty to control the country's border due to the extensive uh, maritime area uh, beside the prosperity of the local economy, which has attracted foreigners to come. So Malaysian uh, demographic itself uh, has a multiracial mature, population uh, mixed with uh, religious diversity. So um, and its neighboring countries uh, also have historical and cultural similarities, languages and religion. So uh, it makes it difficult to see uh, the social and political changes of this country. The nonetheless, uh, demographic of ma majority Muslim population of Malaysia has been overshadowed by elements that uh, carry fundamentalist ideologies that can trigger chaos and, and, and as such, Malaysia is seen as uh, a target of terrorist groups and militant movement, uh, and, uh, as well as the existing terrorist movement in Southeast Asian region. So Malaysia has also bears the burden of being uh, the recipient of uh, the problem due to Malaysia's position at the heart of the Asian region. So. Uh, Malaysia is seen as a strategic transit point for most of these problems that come from uh, regional countries. Hence, the biggest uh, threat facing Malaysia, of course, uh, therefore, is security and terrorism. The other point is uh, the fact that uh, you know uh, it, it involves uh, uh, a busy uh, Southeast Asian maritime environment uh, that is not confined to physical boundaries. Because uh, you know, uh, Malaysia position uh, is strategic as it borders uh, many countries, including sea and land borders. So um, we are therefore Malaysia therefore is more vulnerable to direct and indirect security issues. And, uh, Malaysia diplomatic uh, relation and cooperation with other countries inter internationally are important. Malaysia's uh, ability to safeguard its interests, especially in the area of uh, security. So, um, taking example of the Lahat Datu invasion, uh, um, you know, the, the security relation and interaction with the Philippine government can at least help to solve uh, the terrorist uh, security uh, problems which 
raised by the Sulu uh, rebel group. So taking a bilateral approach, Malaysia has conducted uh, two-way negotiation with the Sulu insurgent through its medium, uh, its Philippine government. So at least even though the meeting saw a date end, uh, Malaysia was trying to maintain peace and security through uh, negotiation. And uh, Malaysia's position as a member of the ASEAN regional bloc is more likely to result in bilateral cooperation to safeguard national security uh, interests. Uh, you know, why they come to Malaysia? Because financially, Malaysia is seen to be uh, financially stable. Yeah? And uh, the picture is Nasi Abbas, born in Johor Bahru, recruited by Jemaah Islamiyah. Uh, currently, I think, is in, uh, you know, uh, in Indonesia. So, so these are some of the very uh, uh, issues uh, which is actually uh, threaten eh, the, the security of uh, this country. Now, uh, today, we are facing uh, a different threat to global uh, peace and security. So unlike terrorism of the past, some scholars argue that we are now confronting a new kind of uh, terrorism. So in the light of that, uh, you have the uh, resolution 2178, which was adopted by the UN Security Council, which uh, this resolution requires state to take immediate action to counter terrorism. But uh, it did not spell out the meaning of terrorism, which left the state bewildered in drafting their own definition. You know, just until today, um, no country has come to, to an agreement as to the definition of what constitutes uh, terrorism or terrorism. So uh, this poses a serious subjectivity problem as the concept uh, of terrorism, uh, which is very much contested. Huh? And uh, while some uh, people may see an act, of, uh, an act as a terrorism offense, others uh, see it differently. Uh, others see or view it as a struggle for liberation, uh, which, which is justifiable. Huh? Uh, this happened in the Rohingya, Rakhine State, a separate moment in, in southern uh, Thailand. Of course, uh, there is, as I said earlier, how do you distinguish these two terrorists? What well, others say is a terrorist, but what some say is a, a freedom fighter, you know. So it, 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 it does uh, have its, uh, you know, it's debatable and unfortunately until today we are not able to come up with uh, one, uh, one acceptable term as to what constitutes terrorism? And uh, okay, now we come to Malaysia. We, we respond to resolution 2178. So Malaysia uh, introduced uh, a new act, the new Pre Prevention of Terrorism Act called POTA, yeah? um, an act uh, 2015. It was enacted and, and under the Malaysian uh, POTA or the Prevention of Terrorism Act, the term Terrorist Act was cross referred to Section 130B uh, cross to uh, the Penal Code. And according to the Penal Code, Terrorist Act means an act or, or threat of action where the act is done or the threat is made with the intention of advancing a political, religious, or ideological cause. And the act or threat is intended to intimidate the public or section of the public or to influence or compel the government of Malaysia or the government of any state in Malaysia, any other government or any international organization. In addition, uh, in that uh, act, in subsection uh, 3, it provides for any harm or damages inflicted while committing the terrorism act, terrorist act. However, there are exemptions under Section 130B plus 4 where a political protest or industrial action is not considered as a terrorist act if it does not intend harm such as a serious risk to health and safety of the public or section of the public. So such exception does not exempt uh, legit legitimate form uh, of protest. Now, in seeking uh, to prevent terrorism, the government must be careful not to suppress legitimate uh, dissent. 
under the sky of national security. Another word, terrorism law must also be clear enough, leaving uh, no room for advancing of many uh, interpretations. Right? So this is uh, even more significant uh, when the, the punishment uh, provided in the penal code is severe for suspected uh, terrorist activities. For example, under section 130A, uh, clause 1, sub uh, B, of the penal code, if anyone is found guilty of supporting terrorist act, he or she, she can be liable to a maximum imprisonment of 30 years or life imprisonment or a fine including for future of assets. So the key issue of definition is significant in determining who the state will consider as a ter terrorist and who will be subjected to strict law. Now, in the absence of an ambiguous definition, the cumulative effect will diminish uh, the protection of individual rights, or his or her human rights, and the sanction of harsher penalties that are concomitant with the designation of terrorism. And so this is one concern. And we come back to national security. So here, the two competing issues that trigger many controversial debates between the government and the human rights group. The central thing is how do you balance, yeah? how to balance the protection of citizen personal liberties against national security during a state of emergency. So while the state owes a moral obligation and duty to protect the safety and the well-being of their citizens, in reality, the equilibrium between the two competing issues is a big challenge, especially for the state. Sometimes the state can play the opposite role yeah, as a threat to their own people by legislating laws under the disguise of crime prevention. Yeah. This is observed, especially when the state has widened their power arbitrarily with the enactments of enactment of new anti-terror terror law. So in, in Malaysia, there is already reason to suspect the, the government of using counter-terrorism laws, like the new POTA, to undermine uh, the fundamental. Yeah? For instance, the use of 10 uh, uh, A of POTA 2015. So under the preventive laws, on terrorism, the most controversial aspect is when a person is detained for suspected terrorist activities without first committing the act. So whether this pre-charge detention is considered as legitimate deprivation of personal liberty. So it depends on how a state views such threat. So to prove the legitimate purpose taken by the state, it is always linked to national security consideration for crime prevention. Therefore, the contention here is whether such action taken can be questioned, and if so, who is the one to question it? What happened if the government made the wrong assessment of the threat or risk to national uh, security? Yeah, so, and, and to date, the history of preventive detention laws in Malaysia reveals grave uh, human rights violations linked to their practice by the government. For example, the previous Draconian uh, Internal Security Act, I say in 1960, originally meant to counter communist insurgency in the past. It has been used again for political dissidents. NGO and student activists in the infamous Operation Lalang, for example, yeah, is one, one of it yeah, until it was repealed yeah, lately, until the law uh, basically. It is also feared that in relation to preventing terrorism, preventive detention fe featured in POTA can be a convenient tool for the government for any illegal purpose, just like how ISA was indiscriminately applied during the Operation Lalang. So the way the preventive law operates hinges on future prediction of eminent threat to national security and practically speaking, 
it is an impossible task to test a uh, degree of harm or danger as it is yet to, to occur. Okay? And the difficulties of gathering enough evidence, this is another area, in terrorism cases are also hindered by the transnational nature of terrorism, where coordination between governments and law enforcement agency uh, restrain an effective investigation. This is further compounded by states lacking cap capability or the political will uh, to fight terrorism with their, within their terrorists. So therefore, the, the, the need for early police intervention was understood as one of the principal justification for relying on preventive uh, detention law in Malaysia's uh, counter-terrorism services. It has the effect of buying more time for investigation and intelligent gathering. In preventing a terrorist attack, if police investigation is too late, the impact of terrorist attack could, could well occur with dire consequences which can devastate a large segment of society based on the current trend of terrorist attack. So primarily, this is the dilemma facing the democratic government today in uh, trying to balance national security over personal liberty when implementing uh, counter uh, terrorism strategies. It is also noteworthy that uh, in Malaysia, there are already other laws in place to deal with security threats before uh, the enactment of quota. There is Security Offences Special Measures Act 2012, uh, we call it SOSMA, Prevention of Crime Act 1959, the POCA, and the relevant provision of the Penal Code on the particular chapter. And if you look at uh, the best practice from UK uh, for balancing national security of the state and personal liberty of its citizen. The situation in UK differs slightly from Malaysia. In UK, the Human Rights Act 1998, which acts as a governing framework for human rights issues, are being applied broadly by the British law laws. UK courts are vested with strong authority to declare any inconsistency under the Human Rights Act. Whereas in Malaysia, there is no judicial review, which is permissible, even if there is a clear human rights violation. So this is in a particular section of POTA. And section 8 plus 1 of the Human Rights Act, that is the British Act, sets out a general power to the court to grant such relief or remedy or make such order within its powers as it considers just and proper regarding violation of personal liberties by any public authority. So we don't have this general power given to the court you know, to, to do or to, to act, and to, to grant such relief or remedy if they discover or if in their opinion that there is this violation of personal liberties by any public authorities. Now, what is our view? The Human Rights Commission in Malaysia, we view that uh, preventive detention is a deprivation of a person's right to personal liberty. Therefore, adequate safeguards should always be in place to ensure that persons subjected to preventive detention laws in Malaysia remain free from arbitrary arrest and detention, as guaranteed under Article 9 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Article 5 of the Malaysian Federal Constitution. Now, after the repeal of the Internal Security Act 1960 in 2011, the this commission continued to advocate for legislative reform to preventive detention laws in Malaysia, which is still in force, including the Security Offences, Special Measures Act 2012, and the Prevention of Crime Act 1959, and the Prevention of Terrorism Act 2015. And uh, the commission recognizes that preventive detention is useful in protecting 
national security and public order. However, because the right to life and personal liberty is non-derogable, civil right preventive detention laws must be made and enforced only to the extent necessary and proportionate to meet such uh, exigencies and with judicial oversight. So this is very important. The judicial oversight will be the, the bastion, the, 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 the safeguard uh, to, to human rights uh, in, in, in Asia. So I think I end up ending uh, my lecture. Uh, and, uh, if there is any question, please uh, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Professor Rahmat, for this really important and interesting lecture. Uh, you've touched upon an issue I think that is relevant for many countries. Um, Turkey's one of them. And I think I'm sure we have colleagues here, you know, wrestling with, you know, the issue of terrorism um, and of course the state interests, protecting persons, but also uh, protection of human rights and not to use terrorism and again whatever it is um all avail sometimes you know that's the other for uh, abusing um certain rights so it's a difficult balance and i think that for for a long time um states have struggled with that and this is including some very developed states with very developed uh human rights or civil rights um laws as well um and, and i won't give names but you know there are some examples of that um so i really appreciate that you've given malaysia an example um the struggle but i think also and we may and I'll, uh you know ask some questions as well but i'm very interested as well from the asean perspective um because this is a challenge as well and i hate to name countries but we know right now in myanmar very delicate situation. It's very difficult for ASEAN as an international organization. Um, so you may, I don't know if you, you can comment on that. Uh, on the other hand, I should also allow our participants to ask questions um, to Professor Rahma. But again, we thank you for this very, very interesting and I think highly relevant lecture. And Patricia as well. And Patricia, you may have some comments and some questions to ask. Yeah, thanks, Nilo. For, for the moment, I just wanted to point out that there's um, a comment. I think it's a comment from Nelly in the chat. I'm not sure if she wants to ask a question or make the comment um, uh, live, Nelly, if you want. Uh, first of all, hello, everyone. And thank you, Professor, for a very interesting and for, uh, for a very urgent issue for discussing. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I just uh, re uh, repeat uh, my um, message uh, via chat, but um, sometimes uh, without any justification in any place uh, committed uh, for, uh, by anyone, but uh, sometimes uh, the states um, provocate uh, uh, such kind of uh, terroristic acts uh, without with uh, committing uh, ag aggression uh, or uh, some war crimes uh, by their, themselves and um, in uh, due to international silence uh, community silence and uh, due to useless of uh, international uh, legal instruments uh, this is a very very personal uh, view uh, but um, uh, uh, concerning Turkey, uh, because uh, uh, I, I will be. I, I uh, think we shouldn't name uh, countries. Very impartial, but uh, it's my uh, view of understanding, but uh, without any justification. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think we should be careful about. <laughs> well, how should I respond to that? Because this involves, you know, because uh, my. Uh, lecture is very much uh, maybe on uh, domestic uh, legislation, you know. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, on the international level, um, you know, we, we always believe that uh, multilateral uh, cooperation, uh, multilateral remedy would be uh, the, the answer to 
to the to the to the conflict, you know. So I think we have the UN Security Council. We have the, you know. So so I think I think that 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 need to be resolved uh, multilaterally, not unilaterally. Uh, but I think that that is not um, uh, the issue that I wanted to to bring here is actually, as uh, Dr. Uh, Nolifa Oral said, is how do you balance this delicate situation in uh, domestically, you know, uh, while you want to make sure that your citizens are protected against this uh, security issue uh, or terrorism, uh, you may want to enforce uh, legislation. But when enforcing this legislation, you perhaps uh, would would impede, uh, you know, the very fundamental principle of uh, human rights. You know, so as Dr. Oral rightly said, it's, it's it's not an easy, uh, you know, it's always difficult to ensure, uh, you know, you get both. You know, uh, in Malaysia, we we you know our position as a commission, we. We are in a position to advise and to make recommendations to the government that you can do that, but however, please make sure that the citizens are given as much right as possible. Uh, you know, it, it's not easy because sometimes we receive complaints that citizens are not being given uh, the right to be represented, uh, you know, the right to documentation, families are not allowed to meet with families. So, so we have a duty. Uh, as a commission to tell the government that this is something uh, going against uh, the federal constitution can you you know do you, you know you, you are supposed to ensure or to give uh, all this protection uh, how do you go about but you know the commission has a limited uh, you know what is our limitation that we cannot go beyond that we cannot do follow up we can always ask the authorities you know, what needs to be done? Uh, you have not done this. Uh, this uh, the citizens or this detainees are complaining that they are not given the right to meet the family. You know, so it, at the end of the day, is the authority that that make that call. So our part, therefore, is to ensure to be consistent in in ensuring that once we receive the complaint uh, from the families or the detainees, that something needs to be done, and and uh, we will. You know, but but in doing in, in saying that, it, I have to be fair also on the police has always been cooperative. They they were very much uh, respond to to uh, our you know what we have done, the complaint especially, and they will do the needful, and we will do the follow up. You know, because at the end of the day, uh, you know you, you need to cooperate with the the agencies, the government agencies, the, the enforcement agencies. This is very important. So. Um, so this is what we do in, in, in Malaysia. That, uh, the commission is given that that authority, that mandate. But unlike in India, they have the quasi judicial, you know, authority. We don't have that, but we can. We can. We have a provision on inquiry. We can uh, do, or we can make inquiry, you know, or, or have a sort of a investigation uh, to that extent. So it's not an easy uh, marriage, you know, or do, how do you balance this? It's not easy. Uh, Dr. Aura, you have, I think you have a question. Yeah, no, no, thank you. No, I just want to say, I think you highlighted something that is important. Um, we can't talk about, you know, human rights, the instruments in abstract. The police are very important at the local level and actually training and teaching Mm. Um, that's really important, I think, um, and I, and I guess that's what's happening in Malaysia. Yeah, yeah through the commission. Yeah. We, we we do provide the from time to time. We have this good relation with the police. We do training. We provide the necessary training, the the teaching, uh, the awareness of uh, you know what uh, human rights are all about. The, what are the most uh, which area that they have violated. Uh, the human rights uh, provision under the federal constitution. So, so in that sense, they are very much aware. And and I think because of that sort of training and, and capacity building, uh, we have we receive less complaints. You know, we receive less complaints from uh, the public. You know that I, I suppose that that is a good sign. 
you know. Yeah, so absolutely. We, we, yeah, we move on. We we do you know we we you know we 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 work on the basis that uh, you know um, the complaints come and and you have to act on the complaint and respond with immediately and tell the the authorities that this has been committed and and they have to improve. They have to do something. You know something like that. So uh, let me ask you then, uh, the the ASEAN uh, or ASEAN, I never say, do they, um, so is there something, I'm just, for example, the EU has regional, you know, approaches, but I don't want to compare it's different, but at least in terms of um, these issues, whether it's call it human rights or civil rights, yeah. do, is there programs or how is that handled in terms of, um, for example, uh, do the different ASEAN countries also have commissions similar mm. to Malaysia? Yeah, we do. Uh, ASEAN do have that uh, sort of commission, and we have uh, an association, uh, sort of where uh, Southeast Asian countries have that uh, uh, the what we call it the National Human Rights Institution. You know, so we 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 do have a uh, uh, we meet, we discuss on all these issues. How do you improve? Uh, you know, human rights situation in your country, but of course, uh, on the basis of, you know, um, it's, it's difficult for you, as you said, difficult uh, to, to, to speak on or to talk on human rights with your ASEAN uh, colleague uh, in terms of what happened in Myanmar, for example, it's, 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 it's rather difficult in that sense, you know, so, so, um, you know, not the, the most active uh, the national human rights institution would be of course Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, Thailand and uh, you know uh, Philippines these are the most uh, notable ones and and we do uh, share uh, experience with one another recently we had uh, for example the environment you know uh, it's interesting that uh, under the, uh, the current uh, uh, you know sustainable development uh, uh, goal the uh, SDG there are actually human rights provisions and, and we, we would leverage on those initiatives, you know, so it, it makes, uh, you know, us as human rights uh, uh, national institution more, um, in that sense, people are readily to accept, uh, you know, what, what is found in those uh, initiatives under the, the uh, SDG. So we are using that as a very important tool. And one of it is environment, and and we in, in our commission now trying to push the idea to expand the definition of right to to live and liberty to the extent of right to have clean air. Ah, you know, you know. So right. we are pushing this. So I think we learn a lot from our friends from uh, Thailand. I think they have done a lot. They have established a uh, very good mechanism. They use uh, the tools, the EIA tools, as an important uh, mechanism, you know. Uh, and and these are things that we learn from one another. And I think I'm very happy that uh, that uh, environment, uh, environment, uh, or or the climate change, all this has given us more. Uh, I think it has inspired me that uh, I think there is room for you know. So we are going to, uh, to advise the government that perhaps you have to reflect on, uh, you know, that definition of uh, right to live uh, and, and liberty to include a right to have clean uh, and healthy uh, environment and clean air, you know, something like that. So, so this is something that we are pushing, you know, and I mean, as far as my commission, the commission is concerned. That's, yeah, that's great. I should bring in Patricia. All right now as well because the commission our sea level rise work mm -hmm. and um, in the second report uh, Patricia examined human rights aspects of course mm -hmm. oh. that might have some um, um, applicability to mm -hmm. sea level rise oh. um, but of course we have that you know UN resolution which is so important and that's yeah. really encouraging to hear now at the local level and I think this is what's important is seeing how the international um, trickles down to where it really matters, um, domestic level. Yeah, yeah. So I think Patricia, I invite you as well. Yeah, sure. No, perhaps I add, I add a, even a maybe a broader question because I think it's very interesting. Uh, you picked, I mean, you picked the issue of um, terrorism and human rights, which is you know, a, you know, a very important um, 
interface um, of human rights, uh, especially after 9-11. And, and, and it's clearly that, you know, a lot of countries were trying to see also, as Nilofer said, what was the right balance um, between, you know, human rights protections, uh, but also, um, you know, protection against terrorism and, and prevention of terrorist acts. And I think in general, we all accepted a little bit of limitations to our own liberties um, in the name of, um, you know, um, being also protected from potential terrorist attacks. Uh, and, and, and I think that, you know, that's a, that's a balance that we need to keep sur surveying. Um, but now you were also mentioning this other, I think, very important interface between human rights, which is the human rights and, and climate change and the environment um, uh, interface. So it's, it's very important to see that uh, and I think that's uh, something that I think our participants should be quite aware. And we saw that yesterday also with a lecture with the, by Professor Maria Gavonelli, who spoke uh, on human rights at sea and, and the interface also between um, law of the sea and, uh, and human rights. That human rights, you know, you, you can't really look at it in isolation. Uh, you have to look at it also you know, with the other dimensions of, of international law. And, and in practice, it's how it works. Uh, you can't really, you know, you can teach human rights on, in isolation, but that's not how it works in, uh, uh, in, in real life. Uh, and I think that's a very important point. But I, I wanted to also, um, you know, on the work of national commissions on human rights, which I think it's really important, you know, at the domestic level, promoting national debate and also, you know, verifying and, and checking what the government is doing and making recommendations. Uh, we have also significant experience in Portugal also with our own um, uh, human rights uh, commission. Um, I think it's very interesting what you were saying, how um, in, in, uh, with neighboring countries in ASEAN, there's cooperation and also to exchange best practices and, and, and chain, uh, exchanges uh, uh, among uh, the, the national institutions in the region. But I also wanted to ask you about, um, uh, and, and maybe this is, we're still um, trying to see if there are some questions from our, our participants, I don't want to prolong too much, but there's also a role in, uh, for national institutions um, at the UN level, um, in the interaction with the Human Rights Council. I don't know if you could say a little bit about that, because that may also be interested, because it's a national commission, uh, but there's also a role to play within the framework of the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. I think Malaysia is a member of the UN Human Rights Council. And uh, one of the things that we are supposed to do at the commission is is to um, uh, to make sure that the government or the state uh, ratify uh, the instruments, the, the international uh, instrument on human rights. Uh, you know, there are many, there are ten. You know, so Malaysia, for example, uh, has signed only three. So we got seven more to, to sign. So this is a, a big task, a big challenge for for the country really. Uh, while other countries do not have that problem, uh, especially when it involves, uh, you know, ISIS, for example, is something, uh, you know, we one, one time tried to push, but because uh, they involve domestic issues in relation to religion, to ethnic, uh, uh, you know, so, so it, it didn't really, uh, perhaps at that time, Malaysia is not ready. So what we, we have done at our level, the commission, is to come up with the legal framework, you know, because much of these uh, international treaties uh, are not being domesticated, you know, uh, or, or once you ratify certain treaties, you need to, to, to have a ready uh, domestic law that, that support, uh, that uh, would, uh, you know, confirm uh, or, or, or uh, enforce, comply with the international treaties, you know. I mean, one of it is a cross-room statute of ICC. You know, if you ratify, you need to ensure that national laws uh, are to support those things, you know. So many of the definitions need to be incorporated in, in the local legislation and act of parliament to enforce those things. Because again, this will depend on whether the country is uh, monoist, practice monism or dualism. You know, in Malaysia, we practice dualism. So therefore, there is this, the duality of, you know, and uh, one recognition of international treaty. Secondly, uh, to make sure that once we ratify at the domestic level, it has been domesticated or it has been uh, done, you know. 
So these are work that we are doing at the moment in Malaysia. Uh, I think we need to, to be prepared, as you said, that there must be a lot of conversation, especially uh, by the, the citizens, to understand why Malaysia wants to ratify, for example, the international treaties on human rights, and whether we are ready, and, and, and that, uh, you know, uh, what is important is the, the, the narrative, the advocacy to promote this inter international treaty. Very important, uh, especially when it comes to uh, application of it at the, on, on the ground. You know? So we do not want to have a situation where government ratify the treaties, but then uh, number, uh, the most important thing, whether it is being enforced or not, you know, it's always the, the question of compliance and enforcement. So this is how we, we do here in the commission. We definitely will advocate the importance of it, what are the impacts, and we try to convince the parliamentarian to talk to their constituency, you know, the importance of this. If we are going to rectify it, what are the impacts, what are the benefits that the country will get at the end of the day? So this is our, our job at the commission. Patricia? No, thank you so much. Uh, I think that's uh, very important uh, because it's something that we don't talk a lot, I guess, in these lectures about the roles of the uh, role of the national uh, commissions and um, and also, I mean, the work that they have to do. Um, and it's very important that they do from the domestic um, point of view because in the end, I mean, it's uh, it's really through national um, legislation and and, mm. and application of human rights um, um, law that uh, that you get the best uh, that the best results. Um, you know, you always have even if you want to have access to uh, where where there's a regional court um, exhaust the local remedies. If you want to have access to um, uh, the UN uh, human rights committees, you also have to exhaust local remedies. So it's very important to have that machinery in terms of the domestic uh, level. But perhaps maybe we have one or two questions from our participants. Uh, we have about a minute <laughs> left, Patricia. So maybe it's a, there are no pressing questions. And I think uh, um, we may just end up wrapping up. But I have to say, I've just follow up. I mean, the point made, human rights is cross-cutting issue. And, and I think, it, I don't think we thought it that way, but it worked out. Where, as Patricia said yesterday, we had law of the sea in human rights. Today, you gave a really good example um, at the local level, the domestic level, but there are so many other places. Uh, we talked about the environment. Um, obviously, we talked about sea level rise in human rights. So it really um, is pervasive and it's so important. But I think the point of terrorism is obviously a very sensitive, delicate issue. Um, and the whole, I mean, this whole definition, I know at the sixth committee, the whole issue of terrorism has been an ongoing, you know, for a long time. Um, so, but, uh, so I think Patricia and I, and we all thank you really uh, for giving us this very informative um, lecture. And it really is important to know what's happening in countries. And I really appreciate, I think Patricia as well, and all, learning what's happening in Malaysia. You know, I think that's so important. It's, a, it's an important country. Um, so this is very enlightening for us. And so we thank you so much and wish you continued fantastic work in the commission. And we look forward to seeing you in Singapore. <laughs> yes, we must meet. <laughs> right. I know we have to meet, it's been yeah. a long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so any, any final words from you, Patricia? Oh, just uh, also again, thank you so much. You get our virtual applause because that's what we can do on Zoom. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.